thank you. We're going to finish up our series today, and then uh, tomorrow we'll start looking at what makes our series so interesting. I mean, concretely, if you remember when I introduced power series and I said they were interesting because we could use them to represent functions, and I gave an example in Desmos where we had the cosine, and then we did a better and better approximation with um, polynomials, We'll see where that polynomial came from, and we'll see other important power series. But for now, we have to finish this section. We have to talk about the radius of convergence. And this is an idea I touched on yes, Monday, if it must now be, where if you have an infinite series, um, it can converge or it can diverge. And different values of X give you different infinite series. So, I mean, if we have, if we have the sum from zero to infinity of one over N, times x to the n, then if n is 0 0.5, we get the sum 1 over, I said x equals 0 0.5, but did not write it. If x equals 0 0.5, we get this infinite series. Whereas if X equals two, we get a different infinite series. And there's no reason that both of those infinite series have to converge or both of them have to diverge. It's perfectly possible that one converges and one diverges. So the question then becomes, for what values of X does a power series converge? And I'll state, uh, I'll state it as a theorem, I guess. Theorem. Suppose we have a power series. Then it converges. Well, the way I've written this power series, there are only three options. It could converge everywhere. It could converge on an interval centered around zero, or it can, could converge at one value and only one value. 
x equals zero always gives us a convergent series because if x equals zero, we're just adding zero to itself a bunch of times and that's zero. So those are our options everywhere on an interval centered around zero or nowhere except at one point, nowhere except at zero. And if you think of an interval as kind of a kind of a one-dimensional circle. That's where the idea of an interval having a um, radius comes from. And this value of R gets a name. It gets called the radius of convergence. And if the series only converges at zero, we say that the radius of convergence is zero. And if it converges everywhere, then there really isn't a radius of convergence, but we say the radius of convergence is infinite. And in practical terms, these are our only options. The textbook really gets lost in the weeds here because the textbook is really interested in asking, well, what happens at the end points of the interval? And it turns out that I've written this as an open interval. I've written it to not contain its end points. There is, it is possible that the series converges at its end. But that's just not interesting. I mean, the textbook is wrong to spend so much time on it. In practice, we're only interested in the radius of convergence. And if there's a finite radius, we just want to know the finite radius and the exact details of what happened at the end points don't matter to anyone. And we, we might talk more about why they don't matter to anyone, but um, once we start looking at examples and looking at series with finite radii of convergence. In practice, um, the power series we're going to look at are mostly going to be like this. Um, but, but that has some implications, right? Like, suppose we're looking at a function that isn't defined at zero, and you want to approximate it with a power series. Well, something's weird then, because the power series is always defined at zero. Every power series of this form is always defined at zero. So that would mean that if we wanted to use a power series like this to approximate, oh, the natural logarithm, let's say, we are flat out of luck. Um, you can have power series center. We say um, that this power series is 
centered at zero, and that's very literal. Zero is the center of this interval. You can have power series centered at other values, and that's reflected by, what do I want to use, A. That's reflected by a horizontal shift. If we have a power series like this, it's now centered at A. And the second case is now that the power series could converge on an interval centered around the center, very literal terminology. And the other cases are unchanged. This power series could, well, that's a lie. The third case then becomes, that the power series only converges at A. And the reason for this, the reason for this change is that X equals A makes all of the terms zero. So X equals A gives you the sum of zero in a power series that looks like this. The first case really is unchanged. Um, this power series could converge everywhere as well. And for finding, sorry if I'm a little sluggish today, I'm just coming off of some minor, minor flu or something. or minor food poisoning, I think. But anyway, that's, that's nothing to do with you. Finding the radius of convergence. Um, 99 times out of 100, a number that, that I made up, but I'll bet is pretty accurate. The radius of convergence is found using the rate, the ratio test. And um, let's see how the ratio test performs here. So let's first of all remember what the ratio test is going to tell us or how this is going to work. We're going to take the limit of a ratio. And if the limit is less than one, we'll get convergence. If it's greater than one, we'll get divergence. 
If it equals one, the ratio test fails. That's never going to be something we worry about in this context. Um, this is going back to what I was saying, where we have these intervals and at the ends of the intervals, maybe it converges, maybe it diverges. That's going to be reflected by the ratio test failing. But I've also said that I don't care what happens at the end points of the interval. So these are the only two cases we're going to be interested in. And let's see how this works in practice. Let's, um, let's define a power series. Negative one to the N times X to the N over N. And let's see if this thing um, converges, or I should say, instead of phrasing it like that, let's see where this thing converges. If it's everywhere, if it's at zero, or if it's on some interval centered at zero. So we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, these, uh, these never look very nice to start with. We've got that big fraction. And then we've got a, uh, another fraction in the denominator. So we've got this improper fraction, one fraction divided by another fraction. And we've got to simplify this thing. Hopefully, uh, what I said last week is true. This week, I'll get your um, homework graded before the next set is due. So I will get your homework graded by Friday. Unfortunately, haven't had a chance yet. Some things have come up. So I don't know how at this point I haven't looked at your ratio test homework. I don't know if you think it's straightforward or if you think it's difficult or what. Um, so let's go step by step. We've got here, we can write this as um, a single fraction in both the top and the bottom. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the reciprocal of the denominator. So we're going to flip top and bottom, and then we're going to multiply it by the numerator. So a little crunch here, but that negative one times n plus one, we'll get a negative one to the n under it. That x to the n plus one, we'll get an x to the n under it. And then this n plus one that we had in the denominator of the top is going to get an n over it. And we are taking the limit as n goes to infinity of this thing. I'm going to simplify this a little before I go any further. Well, 
no. I, and this is this is whiteboard philosophy. This is I'm running out of room on the whiteboard. I that is not really relevant anymore. I can just copy this over. Negative one to the n plus one over negative one to the n, x to the n plus one over x to the n, and then n over n plus one. And two out of three of these terms, I mean, I'm thinking of this now, we've got that, we've got that, we've got that, and we'll look at each of them separately. Um, two out of three of these terms simplify. In particular, the terms that I still have circled simplify. Um, because when we have division, when we have a common base, we just subtract the powers, or we subtract the exponents maybe I should say. So negative one to the n plus one over negative one to the n is negative one to the n plus one minus n. And here I really will just simplify without recopying everything. X to the N plus one divided by X to the N is X. Exact same argument. N over N plus one does not simplify. Now that negative one isn't doing anything. That negative one we can dispose of. And the argument here is that if we've got an absolute value, we can break it into two absolute values like so. The absolute value of a product is the product of the absolute values. And the absolute value of negative one is positive one. And of course, multiplication by positive one doesn't do anything. So we're left with this. And this limit, um, is this the first time maybe we've taken a limit as n goes to something and we've had x's? Oh, no, no, this is actually very similar to when we were taking derivatives using the definition and we had x's and h's and we were letting the h go to zero. Here we're letting the n go to infinity. So the key point here is that as n goes to infinity, x isn't doing anything. I mean, x is x no matter what n is doing. So as n goes to infinity, x is staying x. n over n plus one, this fraction, is going to one. And if that's not if that's not obvious to you, you can, you can get it very quickly using L'Hopital's rule. 
the derivative of the top is one, the derivative of the bottom also one. So this limit is one. So this limit is the absolute value of X. And now we were using the ratio test. So remember what that's telling us. Clear this. If the limit is less than one, the series converges. And we don't need to worry about divergence. If this, um, again, because we're not interested in the case where the ratio test fails. We'll just say that when the limit doesn't converge or when the series doesn't converge, it diverges. So we'll just look at when the series converges. And again, try to make sure we're on the same page here. We took the limit of the ratio we got this absolute value of X. The ratio test says that if the limit is less than one, the thing converges. So we're putting those two pieces of information together that if the absolute value is less than one, the series converges. And now you have to uh, remember how to solve these absolute value inequalities, the, the curse of, of college algebra students everywhere. Um, saying that the absolute value of a quantity, in this case, the absolute value of X is less than a number, is the same as saying that X is between the negative uh, version of that number and the positive version of that number. So X has to be between negative one and one. If it is, the series converges. So we've got an interval centered around zero where the series converges, precisely one of the cases we said we might have, the second case that I wrote on the board. The radius of convergence here is one. In practice, it diverges everywhere else. I mean, as a, from a purely mathematical point of view, at the endpoints, which I haven't included, it might also converge. But again, we're not really interested in what happens at the end. Points. And we'll see, I said we might, I'll make this more definitive. We'll see why we're not interested in what happens at the endpoints when we start actually using these series to do something. So that's the idea of finding the uh, the radius of convergence. Once in a blue moon, you might want to use the root test, but 
it's ordinarily going to be done using the ratio test. And the other tests are out. I've never seen anyone try to use limit comparison or comparison or any of the rest for this. Um, it's either going to be ratio most of the time or root maybe occasionally. What happens, we said there were three cases. Somewhere we said that, we said that here, and then we said that here. We've seen an example of the second case where we've got this interval and it converges on the interval. Let's see if we can give examples of the other cases. Probably not both of them, given the time restraints we're working under, but at least one of them. Let's look at n factorial times x to the n. Here's a power series. Let's hit it with the ratio test. I mean, our goal to probably get, write it down. Our goal is to find the radius of convergence. We'll hit it with the um, ratio test. We actually might get to do two more examples because This example I've just realized is going to go pretty quickly. We don't have fractions, so we don't have to mess around and spend as much time simplifying this as we did in the last example. So, n plus one factorial over n factorial is n plus one. X to the power of n plus one over X to the power of n is X. So n is going to infinity. And that X is staying put. This limit is infinity. It's infinity for every value of X but one. If X equals zero, this limit is zero. If x equals zero, then all of these terms are zero, and we're sending zero, 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 zero. We've just got zero over and over. If x is anything other than zero, like say x were one half, Then as n goes to infinity, we've got one half of infinity, which is still infinity. So this thing never converges, or at least that's kind of what I want to say. This thing only converges at one value. This thing does converge at zero, but everywhere else, of course, infinity is greater than one. 
and the ratio test is giving us divergence. So the ratio of convert the radius of convergence here is zero. It um, converges for only one value of x. It converges at zero itself, but it diverges everywhere else. Does anybody have questions on this? I never know if, I, if I'm showing enough detail, if I'm showing too much detail, if you don't see where some simplification comes from, like if you're not clear on how the factorial is canceled or something, I hope you always feel free to just shout out a question or raise your hand. But if there really aren't questions, then we have time to do what I hope will be an example of a power series that converges everywhere. Let's look at x to the n over n factor. Um, by the way, I mean, one over n factorial times x to the n. So this is a power series, even if it wasn't written in exactly that form. We'll find the radius of convergence using the ratio test. Once again, ah, I always find the ratio test a little hypnotic, which is probably not the best attitude to, to enliven my lectures. Um, we'll multiply by, uh, by the reciprocal of that. We'll get x to the n plus one over x to the n times n factorial over n plus one factorial. What simplification can we do? So x to the n plus one over x to the n. Is x. N factorial over n plus one factorial is one over n plus one. And now n is going to infinity and x is staying x. And this expression is going to zero. And no matter what x is, even if x is a really big number, I mean, even if x is a billion or a trillion, any number times zero is zero. So this limit is zero. And zero is less than one. And this series converges. And it doesn't matter what X is. It converges for every value of X. 
In other words, we're in the first case with an infinite radius of convergence. So those are our three cases. I'd hope to do a few more examples. I'd hope to have you do. It's always my dream to have in class work and then somehow I never find the time. Of course, there's no somehow here. It's because we lost two days thanks to the weather in April. Um, hopefully the last hurrah of winter, I'll, um, I'll move on canvas, I'll change due dates and stuff, so the next section's due date will no longer be showing up as Sunday on your, uh, on your calendar, but the power series homework you can do. And I will see you Monday. And we'd better have our third test the week after this coming week, I guess. Oh, no, I, did I say I'll see you Monday? I won't see you Monday, will I? Because Monday is, uh, Monday is what?